I'd like to welcome everyone. I see that we're live here on Facebook now and our Zoom sessions open and that we're just rolling around at 12 noon, so I'll get us started. Hi, I'm Kristen Lodge, Director of Development and Communications at the Wenatchee Valley Museum and Cultural Center. Welcome to the Public School Reopening Q&A session with school superintendents. Today we have Spanish translation provided by Rosalina Martin with the Wenatchee School District. If you're logged into Zoom, you have the option of listening to the translation on the audio channel. You can do this by clicking on the icon of the globe and selecting the Spanish option. I'll pause and let Rosalina translate that for anyone joining us now. El idioma que le gustaría escuchar, solo haga clic en el botón apropiado para español y escuchará mi traducción. Gracias. Lo siento si algunas palabras no las digo porque es, hablan muy rápido, pero trataré de hacer lo mejor posible. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Rosie. Rosie's going to switch over to the Spanish channel now, so to follow her, you'll click on that globe icon. So welcome. Our mission at the museum is to engage and educate in the Wenatchee Valley community. community. Our museum also serves as a community forum, a place where we can meet with our neighbors, learn about issues important to our community, and discuss thoughts and opinions. While we're not able to gather at our museum right now, we have enjoyed the opportunity to gather virtually in forums like this until we can be back together in person. Our goal today is to provide our community with the opportunity to discuss public school reopening plans and to get your questions answered about what school will look like in the fall. Leading the conversation is Dr. Paul Gordon, Superintendent of the Wenatchee School District. Dr. Garn Christensen, Superintendent of the Eastmont School District. Dr. Tracy Birkendoff Adu, Superintendent of the Cascade School District in Leavenworth. We're also joined today by Executive Director of Elementary Education, Spencer Taylor, and Assistant Superintendent, Matt Charleston, both from Eastmont School District, as well as Diana Hagland from the Wenatchee School District. Welcome all. First, I would like to ask that each school district speak briefly on their plans for reopening. We'd love to have you walk us through your current learning options, a typical school day, and any additional information you'd like to share as it relates to childcare or extracurriculars or other pertinent details. Um, once each district has had the opportunity to outline their learning models, we'll move to q and I'll be on hand to moderate today's session. We've been collecting questions over the past few weeks from the community. Thank you all for sending those in. And we encourage those of you who are joining us via Zoom or Facebook to join in on the discussion live. If you're on Facebook Live, feel free to leave a comment, a question in the comments. And if you're joining us via Zoom, you can ask a question in Q&A or chat. I'll monitor your questions and do my best to make sure they get answered. Without further ado, I'll kick it over to Dr. Gordon to get us started. Kristen, thank you. And thank you to the Wenatchee Valley Museum for hosting all of us. It really is an honor and it's a great communication avenue for each of our school districts to be able to share briefly where we're at um, and how we're supporting students and our staff and our community. So thank you and thank you to the museum for hosting all of us. Um, Diana Hagelin and I are in the office, so we're masked up, so hopefully you can hear us where it's not too muffled. Um, we're, we're really proud of the different opportunities we're able to offer our students. Um, for the last couple of weeks, the Board of Education and all of our school districts have made the decision to go to uh, the virtual online learning 2.0. Um, which will require all of our students to be engaged in online learning virtually. Um, our doors open on August 26th. We also have uh, Wenatchee Internet Academy. And a real differentiator between those two is that WIA, the Wenatchee Internet Academy, are for those parents and students who want to stay online the entire year. We're really encouraging our parents to be really thoughtful about which they want to choose. Uh, but again, the WIA is for those families who wanna be there the entire year for medical, for whatever reasons. Because we also recognize 
some of our students did exceptionally well in the online uh, model and they may want to continue that. So we're asking that parents make those decisions um, prior, so we're not moving students back and forth from the WIA model to the, the more traditional online schools. Uh, so those are our, our two models that we're working from. I'd hand it to Diana to add anything else for us. Um, yeah, currently our building principals are, are just making their way back to the district uh, and working on plans to help families transition into um, online learning. And we're really putting a strong focus on how we engage with our parents and our families to make sure that we have a smooth start to the school year. We recognize that there's a lot of work that needs to be put in to make sure people feel comfortable and ready for that learning environment. So in the next week, we will start reaching out to our parents and inviting them to participate in orientation activities and support sessions to really help have that successful start to the school year. Great, uh, Dr. Christensen, how about from Eastmont, and Spencer and Matt? Spencer looks like you're up. Yeah. You've got your unmute and your video on, right? Yeah. So, uh, and then Garn, you can jump in whenever uh, you're ready. I, I was uh, muted. So, I, I oh. did a great introduction. You just all missed it. So, all right. Uh, I'll be real quick and then I'll hand it off to Spencer. The three of us are in three different offices. So, uh, we're going to be handing this off uh, the baton one at a time. But similar to Wenatchee, uh, we've been in the planning and the developing our, our program, refining our processes from what we did in the springtime and our effort to improve uh, the distance learning. Given current COVID rates, uh, we looked at a lot of different options, but once our health department uh, provided the, the guidelines that we needed to all start remotely, given the rates we have right now, it really narrowed down that we needed to refine and provide the best remote learning possible. So with that, I'll ask Spencer to pick it up. Great, thanks, Garn. So, uh, our, just similar to Anachi as well, we, we gave our parents options. We have a virtual only uh, option. It's called Eastmont Virtual Academy. It's for um, students who uh, would prefer uh, either 100% remote or a more personalized setting once we can have kids back on campus having some on school um, connection with their teacher and uh, peers. Um, so it's a flexible program, more individualized uh, for those who would like that. And then we have the other option is our phase back into normal school. Uh, speaking on behalf of all educators, we're just, we're, we're missing our kids. And we're hopeful that we can get to the point in our community that we can be back with them. Um, learning is so much more effective when we're together. But we do have a good plan for remote starting that way. Um, based on feedback from our uh, parents, uh, they wanted flexibility um, uh, in remote learning. So we will have some um, instruction that is live so we can have interaction um, between our teachers and our students. Every elementary classroom will have a welcome meeting to start the day, checking in with kids, uh, doing a little community building, a little social emotional learning, telling them what they're gonna be learning today. That will be live, but it'll also be recorded for anyone who is not able to attend. Uh, or maybe any families that's struggling to get their little one out of bed, they can uh, watch that later, or families that are working um, in the evening as well. There will be some small group instruction that will be scheduled as well um, each day. The rest of it will be pre-recorded, uh, so it can uh, be accessed by students and parents um, uh, at a time that it works for them. Um, we also are pleased to have uh, one of our staff members uh, putting together right now, next week we'll have some parent training available. So uh, for, our, for, all, for all of our Eastmont uh, parents tuning in, when you're wondering, okay, how do I make this work from home? Uh, Caitlin Walters will be uh, doing some, some training and have some resources for you. And we know that it's a challenge um, for you at home. So. Um, typical day again has that start welcome meeting has um, your main subjects reading writing math uh, and uh, writing and science 
And uh, we also are building in some time so that our teachers can communicate directly with parents um, uh, in the evenings, so some flex time, um, so we can have that check-in communication. I'll hand it off to Matt for the secondary side. Thanks, Spencer. I wouldn't uh, go too much further other than say we really wanted something fluid and flexible so that we could come out of remote learning into on-site learning or part of our students there during the day, um, and then hopefully all students. But if we had uh, you know, an infection or had to shut down a portion of our students, we wanted to be able to quickly transition back into remote learning and not lose learning time. So um, our plan is, is fluid and flexible is the term we're using. At the secondary level, we also were very cognizant of the amount of screen time um, that a kiddo can have um, at one during one day. And so we, we decided to uh, shrink our schedule down to three classes a day and uh, go more intensely in those three courses versus a six or seven period day. And uh, the kids and families can focus on those three classes. We're gonna do that for either six or nine weeks, depending on which school you're at, and then switch and do three, three different courses for six or nine weeks. So take them almost like if you think of those of you that attended college, you had three or four courses that you were more intense in for a quarter or semester. And that's kind of the approach we're taking um, to uh, keep kids from being on the screen as much and really um, provide uh, more intense study for shorter periods of time. So uh, Spencer, I think covered the rest. The other piece was technology. We really invested in technology in our school district, both for students. Every student will have a new Chromebook uh, if they need one. And uh, our staff have uh, added um, teaching stations that are better equipped for remote teaching, bigger monitors, better cameras, um, and even flexibility in moving those document cameras around the room so they can actually go to a board and teach or teach almost like they would in a regular environment. Um, so those are some investments we made as well. Thank you. Um, I'll kick it over to Tracy, Dr. Birkendorf Adu to talk about Cascades model. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just uh, my last name is Beckendorf Adu. It's a terrible last name. That's why it's better just to call me Tracy. Um, it is just great to be part of this um, wonderful group of individuals and thank you to the Wenatchee Valley Museum for inviting Cascade School District to be a part of this. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to run through our plan just a little bit and to do so I'd like to share my screen if that's okay. So when my colleagues are talking about continuous learning 2.0 what we're doing is we're taking some of what we did in the spring and making it improved and making it uh, just a little better for students and parents just based upon what we learn. Uh, we need to start in stage one, so continuous learning 2.0, pre-K through grade 12. But one nice thing is we will have staff on site and hopefully the Chelan Douglas Health District will agree that we can have groups of five students permitted indoors so we can start with students with special needs, students who need extra assistance, and we can provide some in-person support. And we also are starting a um, partnership with the YMCA so that we can have some childcare available for working families. You'll notice that we, as we progress through the stages, we have more and more students coming back to school. We're really looking forward to the day that we can hit stage two, when we can open our elementary schools in a hybrid model at 50% capacity. Uh, in addition to just the continuous learning 2.0 model, we as, um, as Wenatchee and Eastmont have other options, such as the Kodiak Virtual Academy, for grades six through 12, which is our online program for secondary school. Uh, we also in our district have a home link program. So it's a, a family school district partnership where some of the teaching goes on with our, from our parents and some of the teaching goes on with our staff. That's an alternative learning experience that we have available in grades K through eight. Um, I guess in addition, I just wanted to say as far as extracurriculars go, we're going to start out by doing that remotely. Uh, the WIAA has uh, set out a modified athletic schedule that we'll be following as well. 
but uh, I think I agree with all my colleagues that we can't wait to see kids back in person. Uh, we'll be doing some orientations in order to meet them face to face, like get students and teachers meeting each other. And then we just all need to do what, what the Wenatchee's doing right now, wear our masks and uh, so we can get back to school in person at a greater scale. Wonderful. Thank you all for sharing um, those thoughtful plans. We have a lot of really great questions coming in already and we have many that um, have come in in advance. One of the ones that I'm seeing most often is um, people remarking about Spring's online learning experience being a difficult um, fit for students and for families. Can you tell me what the difference between spring distance learning and now fall online learning is? Um, the big difference for us is the ability to be, have the time to thoughtfully plan for it, quite honestly. Spring was three days and we were turning around a, a whole new model. Um, now we've had time to really be thoughtful about how to approach this. We don't have every little uh, piece totally figured out. A again, this is, this is still a new way for us to go down this road, but it really is about trying to make sure we have more structure. We did a number of focus groups with our parents, students, staff, community members, and one of the things they asked repeatedly from all groups, we, we need more structure of a school day. It needs to feel more like a school day. On the flip side, because I, I can see some questions in here, how do you have that flexibility? And it's trying to thread that needle as Spencer and Matt talked about. There are some opportunities to, to record. We're still working through some student privacy issues um, because we, we need to make sure um, that our students are protected online as well. So we're, we're navigating those, um, but we do want to create more flexibility for our students and our community members or our parents uh, because we know that's a that's a big issue uh, that some have however our, our schedules which are posted online uh, we presented those the other night at our board meeting uh, talked about very similar to to what Eastmont and, and Cascade is talking about there's going to be moments in time where there's gonna be direct instruction. It's gonna be live, it's gonna be with teachers, it's gonna have that SEL component to it. Um, but there's also going to be a moment in time where you know, kind of that computer is closed and students are working. But then our teachers are gonna be there still to say, okay, hey, we're back in five minutes. Do I wanna see your work? So there has to be some of this interaction going on. So even with the videos recordings, um, Students will have a, a different experience when it's recorded than when you're uh, attending online in, in the synchronous world for, for many of our classes that we're having. Um, Diana, anything else that you would? Yeah, I would say built into our schedule too and thinking about parents is um, we've built in some advocacy time, whether that be a daily check and connect with um, students and families in our elementary schedule at the end of every day, students will have a chance um, to connect with the teacher. Parents will have a chance to connect with the teacher and ask questions um, and just really support those families. That'll be woven into the middle school and high school. It'll look a little different. Um, for middle school, they're actually looking at a, a plan to have advocates that take small groups of students and really work with them to help address and eliminate any barriers if there's challenges with student attendance or just finding that a student is struggling. Um, and then the high school will be reaching out to every student who doesn't show up to class and connecting with those families to address those barriers. So that's really a big component of our schedule. Um, in addition to the instruction time is how we build those supports in um, that are personalized for each student as we go through the year. Would Eastmont and, and Cascade like to add anything to that or does that adequately capture your responses as well? Uh, I think Diana and Paul did a great job as usual. A couple other things I'm sure Wenatchee and Cascade have heard from parents was they wanted, they wanted to make it as simple as possible as far as the technology from home. So instead of teachers using different platforms uh, for their classrooms and sharing assignments and different 
tools for video streaming. They said, we want one. One, and so uh, Eastmont will be using Google Classroom uh, for all of our uh, classes, as well as Google Meet for our um, video streaming. They wanted uh, flexibility, and so that's where we're recording, um, pre-recording a lot, so we watched um, uh, when they're able to. Um, and then I think the, the feedback, which uh, Paul and Diana talked about giving, um, uh, we, th that was a challenge because it, it was new to us uh, virtually. So it was difficult at first to give real meaningful feedback. And I think with any, um, think of new technology, you know, we've all gotten like a, a new phone or a new computer or a, a TV. At first, it takes a long time to do anything because you're just getting used to all the, the features. And it's the same thing with remote instruction. It was kind of clunky at first. Um, we were giving our best efforts as we're uh, teachers in all of the districts around here. Now we're used to it and more comfortable. And so we're able to do more and do it more effectively. Um, Matt, did I miss anything? I'm sure you got something to add. Actually, no, I'll, I'll pass on this one. You did a good job to, I'll let Tracy go. Well, not to bore y'all with screen sharing, but I think I might share a screen again. Um, so this is our document called um, Best Practices for Continuous Learning 2.0. So what we did is we surveyed students, we surveyed parents, and we surveyed staff after the spring to find out what are the things that really worked with online learning that we could replicate um, amongst our different classrooms. So we just kind of put this together and we have this on our back to school page on our website and we have formulated our continuous learning 2.0 plan based upon the feedback that we received like i said from students parents and staff so i agree with a lot of what my colleagues just said i think we're pretty much aligned on that and i do believe that we're going to have a better experience this fall because we learned from everybody around us in the springtime I also do want to clarify one thing. Continuous Learning 2.0 isn't only online. That's why we don't just call it online school. So there can be packets that are sent home. There could be activities that are sent home. There are different things that you can do that are not limited to the computer. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget that because we're so focused on the technology piece. So I just thought I'd bring that up. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's a great segue into some other questions that we're seeing. Um, in light of recent health data, all three districts have made a pretty late stage change in how our school districts had hoped to roll out their fall reopening plans. Taking this into account, do you have confidence that our schools, teachers, and staff are really ready for this online learning format and a brand new software and model? And how have teachers, staff, and families, and students been involved in planning for this reopening? Do you want us to go or do you want to start with somebody new? It's up to you. Go for it. You're unmuted. So I think just right, the right. day while you have it. So we'll make this short and sweet. Yes, we're ready. <laughs> we, are, we are ready. Um, a lot of thought has gone into all of our, our preparation in all the school districts. And oftentimes we're on weekly uh, conference calls and videos w with each other, really thinking through these processes and double checking to, to make sure, are we on the right page? Are these things that, that are gonna work? Um, we believe with, uh, we're, we're having uh, a launch to learn for our first week with our parents and our students where we're really focused on um, the, the, the technology, the support, the, the schedules that our students are gonna be participating in and the social emotional learning that is gonna be key. You know, one of the things that we have to remember was our staff had seven months of getting to know our students and our families. Mm -hmm. For the most part, every student and every staff member will be reintroducing, will be introducing themselves to each other in these first couple of weeks. So we need to make sure that we give our our staff and our, our students that opportunity to connect as people. Ultimately, at the end of the day, school education is relationship-based. 
It's better when we're in person, but that's not where we're at right now. So we have to purposely create opportunities for families to connect, for students to connect, and for teachers to connect with their kids. Again, part of that will also be setting up those expectations. For us, as Matt and Spencer talked about, we too have one um, online platform that we're using, so, you know, kind of that central hub for all of our information. For us, it's Canvas, but that's brand new. That's not what our students used last spring. That's not what our parents used last spring. So we need time for them to be able to engage in that work. But do we believe that we're going to be ready? Yes, yes. Uh, we've had a lot of engagement with teachers. Um, we've had a number of committees where teachers have been essential to really thinking our, our processes through at like 8.30 this morning, I was on a group with, with teachers and they were just problem solving through a number of different issues. I would add to what Paul just shared. This is going to be hard. Even regular school in the best of conditions, we have students who struggle for various reasons. We have um, programs that reach out to those students on a daily basis to connect pull them in to ask what we can do to support those students. Those same things will be uh, occurring here as we open up our schools. It, school has always been a partnership uh, with young people. It takes a, a parent to get them up, get them going, make sure they're ready to, to head out that door. In this case, they'll be staying in the door for a while, but uh, do they have a location? They can sit down, they can engage. Uh, online education has been around for a long time. It's interesting. We've had a um, an objective in our long-term improvement plan as a district to make sure that students had some experience in online education. We are going to meet that objective 100% this year. Uh, my focus will be to make sure that we're also cohorting, as Paul said, and Spencer, so that uh, as we move forward, ideally if we get uh, some exposures, which we anticipate we will, uh, that it will have minimal effect and perhaps a classroom or a cohort of classrooms that have some shared activities, may need to go remote uh, for the, the two weeks. But our goal will be to keep schools open just as soon as we get that green light uh, from our health department and continue to keep them open. It sounds easy in conversation uh, for some of us that uh, as we watch what's been happening in the valley, it can, can be a real challenge. But um, educators tend to be people who learn quickly, they're prepared, they're organized, and I believe that's what parents will find uh, is we start to engage students here in just a, a little under two weeks. I, I would add uh, to what Garn was saying there is that next week we have a, what we call August Institute, and that's a, a training week for our teachers and, and our staff. And we revamped that, Spencer led that, uh, to just basically give time for teachers to plan with colleagues, to meet in their building teams, and uh, really um, help them feel comfortable um, heading into this year. We do have some training specifically on safety and on the use of technology, um, but we, we carved out a lot of time for individual teachers and teams of teachers just to meet and collaborate and work together. At the same time, we're gonna be handing out Chromebooks to all of our students next week, helping families begin to prepare um, uh, for the, uh, the following week when school begins. And then we have a real intentional focus in our first couple of days of school of meeting with families, of outlining um, what are the expectations, especially in our older uh, junior high and high school classrooms? We really want to send a message that this is school and you will attend and you will have homework and you will do assignments. We really want to build that expectation that this is going to be an academic uh, endeavor. And at our younger grade levels in the elementary and middle school, we're going to focus a lot more on helping parents help their students. What can we do to be good partners in helping parents understand the technology and understand the, the learning platforms and how they support their children? So. There are a lot of intentional uh, efforts underway to, to get this off to a good start. Good, thank you, Matt. That's a good segue to the next question about how teachers are being trained in these online learning and new platforms. We've heard from Eastmont. Does one, Matchy and Cascade want to comment on that? I guess I'll jump in next. So as far as the online learning platforms go, Cascade as, um, as my colleagues um, are talking about in their districts, we have had to streamline our learning platforms. 
Last year, we had already adopted Canvas as our learning management system at the high school. So this year, we're actually going to be using Canvas for grades three through 12, so that parents have a more consistent experience through the grades and students also. And we're going to be using Seesaw for K through two. So we have some trainings set up. The state has also put some trainings together, but we're working with uh, training our staff right now and next week on the learning management platforms. But we already knew that we were moving in that direction. So we didn't just start like next week. We were planning for this, especially in our secondary schools. Um, I did want to kind of jump in about other training uh, based on one of the questions in the chat. Another training that we're working on is trauma-informed training. We're all going through trauma right now. Adults, children, our society, we're all going through trauma. So we want to use trauma-informed best practices in order to help our students, our families, ourselves, our communities deal with the situation that we're in. So that's another piece of the training that we are undergoing. Um, yeah, over in Wenatchee too, same thing, we're using the trauma-informed practice. Uh, SEL, as I mentioned earlier, is a big part of our daily schedule. Um, next week, we will jump right into training our, our instructional staff on Canvas, our new learning platform. But I also wanted to mention that our instructional paras will also receive that same training so they can come alongside um, their education partners and really understand the tools so that they can help parents. And then lastly, our um, Migrant Bilingual Parent Pack, we are going to be training them on how to use Zoom as well as Canvas so that we can use them to help train their, their parent peers, um, their students, kids in the neighborhood, and really help to empower those parents to um, lead that effort out in the community. You know, I just add a couple pieces to the attendance as we're watching our chat. Uh, with the flexibility, we're, we're thinking about how does that attendance look in a, in a flexible world as well. We don't have a perfect answer today, but no, we're going to have an answer by the time uh, we're ready for our students because we recognize uh, students will, will show their attendance in different ways. We just saw um, the state released guidance on attendance just today. So we need to have a moment or two with that, grapple with that but we will have the flexibility of attendance, but attendance based off of what I saw from the state today, it is required. So everybody, as Spencer and Matt talked about, it is a requirement. The flexibility piece, that's what we have to figure out. How are we going to mark that when a student is present and we can see their digital footprint in many ways um, as they log into Canvas and as they uh, participate in different sessions and when they're turning in there, their uh, exit tickets and assignments on a daily basis. So those pieces will, will be accounted for um, if you're during the class period or in that flexible world. So those are gonna be key pieces to making sure that school is, is still a place for some accountability for the learning. I appreciate that. Thank you for that information. A quick follow up on readiness. We're seeing a question um, about there, I believe there's 13 days away from the start of school. Not that any of us as parents are counting, right? But um, we're, we're wondering as when will we receive um, information on Chromebook pickups as well as um, information on specific schedules related to our kids' schools. I've watched um, all three uh, school board meetings um, that have been happening that, for all the districts and tried to comb every website. I'm seeing a lot of proposed schedules. When will parents see, um, you know, real tangible um, information related to their students' education? Uh, in Wenatchee, early next week, it's our intent that uh, principals and schools will start sharing out what those schedules do look like. We're going to be launching that information with uh, pre-recorded videos from our building principals that really welcome families and kind of give them a broad overview of what they can expect at the start of school um, and what Continuous Learning 2.0 is and some of the meeting routines and daily schedules. Um, they'll provide that information of what parents need to know and also what's the next step, which is the first week of school. And as Dr. Gordon mentioned, what that looks like for us is our launch to learning week. And that's that week where we all get, we're meeting with our teachers, whether that be virtually or in-person uh, meetings, and we're getting oriented to what school is gonna look like. 
And a lot of um, times that's gonna be an opportunity for parents to ask questions that they might have um, and get that one-on-one -on -one time with their teacher to really feel like, okay, I can bring that anxiety level down just a little bit. I'm a parent of two elementary age students. I work for the school district and I still feel that. We all do as we, we approach um, the start, start of the school year, but we're really um, gonna start messaging hard early next week. I know we all wanna know right now that our building principals are really putting those pieces together and developing the schedules for uh, Chromebook distribution, when that's gonna happen, the method in which it's gonna happen, and looking at what students still may need devices. Um, one challenge that we've run up against is supply chain, and that's really uh, caused us to maybe rethink how we do our distribution because we just simply aren't getting the devices in in time due to constraints on the supply chain because we're not the only school district and my colleagues aren't the only school districts ordering in Chromebooks. We placed a large order back in the spring uh, and we may not get those devices in time for every student to have uh, what they need at the beginning of you know, the very first day of school. So we're working through that and that's where we're, we're trying to hold off as much as we can in communicating. Um, but early next week, we'll start preparing families with what that's gonna look like and, and when they can pick those devices up. Similarly at Eastmont, um, information will be coming out very soon in the next couple of days. Uh, Chromebook distributions have been planned for next week. I know elementary schools starting Wednesday and then Thursday. So the details will be go going out uh, for each school. And so for our Eastmont parents, if you haven't signed up for Parent Square, downloaded the app, that is one of our main new communication tools. So you can be uh, connected if you have several kids, you know, in maybe different schools, and maybe they're in different programs or athletics. When we get those uh, back up, you can basically subscribe to each of those um, news sources and you can get that information. And for Rosie and our um, families that uh, prefer the Spanish, uh, it, it, you can put in your uh, preferred language and it will automatically translate that for you. Obviously it's not a perfect translation, uh, but it is um, good because we want to make sure that all our families get all the information as soon as it's ready. So that's called Parent Square. For us, our uh, principals have started sending out their information. So it'll be within the next few days that um, families will receive their schedules and information. Uh, we're a little different. We don't give out Chromebooks. We give out laptops. Um, we're kind of a Microsoft district. And for our younger students, iPads. So I guess we're Apple and Microsoft, but more, more Microsoft, I guess. But we will have those available. We will be delivering them during orientation. And people should get that specific information any minute. Great. One, I, I have one, some. Oh, go ahead. One caution I would like to suggest is I know that uh, I witnessed Chromebook check-in at the end of the year and we had students and we had parents and we had employees who were excited to see each other forgot for a moment social distancing forgot for a moment the masks and ran up gave each other a warm greeting which was wonderful to see but we really are going to be adhering as closely as possible to very strict safety protocols if we want to get schools open we want them to continue to be open. We're going to have to ask parents to uh, be very patient. They're gonna experience some slow lines, some processes that are a bit clunky at times. They're going to be asked to remain in their vehicles, stay separate. It's, it's not how humans typically interact, especially young people. They're like puppies. They love to greet each other warmly and tear off and go play. And we, we just have need to be as cautious as we can. I'm just, I've checked the rates today in our valley and it appears that we may be actually starting to trend downward. We all need to hope that that continues and we all need to do our part as educators and community members. So just a, a caution out there for all of us. Thank you. Um, as we, I'm, I'm gonna skip forward to family support at this point and I'd love to come back to some follow-up questions that I have for you on some of the things that you've said, but, um, I'm, we're seeing a lot of questions about what the expectations are for family and caregiver involvement and oversight and support for online learning. Um, I'm the parent of two elementary school, young elementary school students. So um, I know that that was a pretty full-time job for us um, in the spring. 
Um, a follow-up question on that is, has there been any consideration for a model similar to Wenatchee's Valley Academy? And I know Eastmont and Cascade have similar models with homeschooling support, where parents can get the support to execute an in-person learning plan for their children that partners with the school district. We're all being so patient and respectful of each other. So uh, sorry, I just I uh, can't handle the, the dead airtime. So I'm just going to jump in. Um, so Eastmont um, has a program it's called Home Field, and uh, Home Field is kind of an umbrella program that has several uh, parts to it. One of those parts is a parent partnership for those families that uh, do want to have more of a uh, homeschooling, very parent-led. Um, uh, learning experience. So our teachers support parents, support with curriculum, give guidance on how to best support their um, child. Uh, there's also the Eastmont Virtual Academy lives within that umbrella, which could be 100% remote or it could have some face-to-face uh, -face when we're able to do that, but it's very individualized and uh, personal um, for students. And Kristen, I forgot the rest of your question. I'm sure I missed something. So I'll stop and I'll let my colleagues answer it because I'm sure they could answer it better than I could. But you answered great the, um, the homeschool type model. The, the other part of that question, and I apologize for the multi-part question, Sven. <laughs> um, what are expectations for family and caregiver invol involvement in an online learning environment? I would add to what Spencer was saying is, it's really going to have to be a partnership. As you know, as a young mother, Kristen, um, setting the conditions, having the, the kids in a place where they can learn, um, making sure that they have an expect that you pass on your expectation that they will participate and, uh, and do the best they can. But it's, especially with younger kids, it's really a partnership with those families. One thing that we're doing that was mentioned that I want to highlight is that we are providing an hour every day for our teachers to use as outreach time. We're calling it flex time where they can call and communicate with the family or parents can call and ask to be, you know, leave a message and ask to be called so that um, individually with families, we can work through those scenarios. It might, it might mean that uh, a family needs to uh, do their work in the evening. Both parents work and it's just not possible to facilitate learning during the day. So they'll work with that teacher on, you know, looking at pre-recorded instruction and making accommodations on that individual basis. So both in the, the programs that we offer, the Eastmont Virtual Academy, or the home field, but also just the, the phased in group, our larger group of, of uh, parents that want their kids in school, but it can't be initially. We're gonna try and really partner with parents because it's tough, it, it is, we have a lot of empathy. And I think we'll probably have a question a little later on, but just especially those parents with special needs students and, and uh, students that haven't been getting the full array of services that they uh, really need to be successful. So we hear you and we're gonna try and partner with you the best that we can. Yes, I'll just add to that. Um, we have our home link program, so kind of a similar idea, similar concept. But for the families in, under continuous learning 2.0, what we really learned was we need to unpack um, what does it mean to be a teacher a little bit more? Because when we sent home like packets in the springtime, a lot of times people might interpret that as a worksheet or something. They didn't um, we had to be a little bit more clear about what are some teaching tips, what are some ways to reach a child who doesn't want to do it, or things like that. So we're going to be really intentional about providing some tips to help kids um, do their work, especially at the younger ages. And then we're putting in some parent support groups and also having kind of like what Matt just said, some office hours, so that not only do we have student teacher communication but we have parent teacher communication intentionally built into the schedule we're hoping that those things will help our parents and they all are by parent request i think all the pieces that were said there i know i think all the districts are doing something very similar where we're one of the things that we heard a lot uh, about was hey you left parents out of the whole pd piece in the springtime and parents need support and i think each of the districts in their communication we heard you we've got to figure out how to support our parents 
um, be it in a homeschool partnership or be it in, as Tracy said, the, the learning, the continuous learning 2.0. But one of the things that I think what we heard was if we create better structure, a school day structure, what we're hoping is that our parents don't have to be that, that direct line teacher that they were in the springtime, that we're able to really rely on, on high quality instruction from our educators. Um, and I think how Matt phrased it, I think it's really good, just creating that opportunity, that time, that space, that's safe for your, your children to be online and learning um, and that supportive environment. I think in all the districts, what we've seen in our overall schedules, not the, you know, the individual student schedule yet, those will come out next week, um, are times, more times for students to take that break, to, to go outside for a moment, to run around. We don't want kids on Zoom or a Google Meet or whatever the avenue for delivery and instruction. That's an important piece to us. And one, quite honestly, we need to think about even when we're back in person. If this is such a good thing, uh, why wouldn't we be doing this all the time uh, to support the, the learner? Because us as adults, many of us sit on Zoom meetings all day long and I wanna you know, run my head through the wall uh, oftentimes and I'm not five and, or a middle schooler or a high schooler. So those are pieces that we're really thinking about from a parent lens, how do we support them? Ensuring that the teachers are really delivering rigorous, robust and important, relevant, learning for our students. We want our parents and our students to really feel like this was relevant. This was important for, uh, for my student to learn. Because like any of us, if it's not relevant, it's really hard to be engaged, no matter how old you are. Um, so we have, that's on us. And that's one of those promises we're making our parents is, it's gonna be a rigorous, relevant learning experience for our students so they are engaged, so they want to participate, so they want it, be a part of the activities in the learning that we're doing and that would allow for our parents to be able to take that step back and not be that direct teacher which we quite honestly that's what we were asking them to do in the springtime i appreciate you speaking to that zoom stress the zoom fatigue where you're on camera all day right we're seeing a lot of questions about how schools can support students mental health, their social and emotional skills, habits and mindsets is all made up a lot by that interaction piece. How can we support them in this um, non face-to-face -face environment? I'll just jump right back in briefly. You know, it, it's, it's nice living in our, our community and, and community members come up to us, parents come up to us and ask us those questions. And, you know, having friends in the community who are parents and they say, you know, I get why you did this. I get the recommendations, I get why the school districts are doing this, but my kids are struggling. My kids are struggling. What are you going to do about this? And it's one of the reasons that we've been really thoughtful about our whole mental health team and making sure, as Diana said earlier, on day one, we are being proactive, we're reaching out, we're making sure we're making those contacts using, because we have some great experts in all of our districts, our counselors, our social workers, our our psychologists, our principals and APs, who, who, where we're at is we wanna be reaching out and we wanna be making sure we're making those connections because I think Spencer said this early, no matter on the continuum, everybody has experienced this trauma, this trauma of this pandemic and it's hit our students too um, just like it is hit a lot of the adults. So we need to be ready to be engaged with them and ready to, to listen and l ready to create support structures to support them through this. Cause this is hard. We're humans. We, we are, we are creatures who, who appreciate the relationships. We need those relationships. We need those interactions. And in this world we're currently in, we've limited that greatly. And we need to remember that our kids are, are struggling in this as well. So that it's top of mind. I know for every one of our districts and how we're reaching out to our kids.
I would echo uh, what Paul just said. You know, there are some amazing experts throughout our school districts that are well connected. As in all educational endeavors, it's a partnership with parents. And I think if parents see any red flags, you know, schools have never provided therapeutic uh, type of uh, mental health treatment, uh, but we do recognize and help refer and help connect parents with resources. We can still do those things remotely. Um, any interactions that we have with students will be monitored and looking at the social and emotional health of the child, uh, working within our own resources, connecting with community organizations to help provide those services. But I think more than ever before, this is a time, as I've shared, that as a community, we need to not hesitate to reach out and say, you know, I've got a 12 year old that is just really having a challenge here. Uh, there are experts in our community that can help provide some suggestions and uh, some resources for families. We'll be doing that as an educational family, and we would just encourage parents to don't hesitate to communicate. We know it's hard, whether it's uh, students of all different abilities. Uh, we have a lot of students whose primary connection is uh, through our extracurricular activities, and those have just disappeared right now. Uh, more than ever before, I think uh, parents need to, to work as close as possible with, with the educators that are assigned to their children. Good, thank you. And Tracy, I know you'd spoken to the trauma training you were providing for your teachers earlier too. Um, let's jump into a comment Matt had made earlier about special needs um, students. How is the online learning platform um, serving students with special needs, whether it be IEP or 504, um, as well as differentiated learning um, for different levels of students? I'll jump in quickly. Uh, it's, it's, I think, hardest on that group, that population of kids. We know that um, a lot of them receive extensive supports, physical therapy, speech, um, different, different uh, um, specially designed instruction. And they just, it's hard to do that through an online learning platform. I think we're gonna be better at it this fall, but uh, I believe all of our schools are prioritizing those students as the first to return as quickly as we can. And so as soon as we get the green light from our, our, our health district and those that are guiding us with those types of decisions, we want those students to start coming back into campus so that we can fully meet their needs. In the interim, we are actually gonna do uh, some limited evaluations with students. Uh, so do they evaluate for those special services or re-evaluations? We're gonna start having some of our school psychologists meeting with kids and families uh, so that we can get plans in place, either remote or in person. Um, that's, that's something that's been really um, on our mind and, and uh, uh, prioritized in our thinking as far as our, our return to school this fall. Thank you. Uh, we have a follow-up question. I uh, was seeing lots of questions both on Facebook and Zoom and prior. Um, ex parents expressing concern about the length and timing of the online school day. Um, normally, we know that busing and transportation weigh into schools' timing decisions, and we know that there's a lot of transition timing, especially for those young ones in the elementary school. Um, it feels like we have an opportunity here to optimize our, our children's peak periods of efficiency and understanding, which online might be a more condensed um, time period. Can you explain how many of the schedules that we're seeing um, arrive at a decision to structure the day based on the normal 7.45 to 2.30 or 2.45 schedule. I think it's, it, it, it's a great question. Um, and it, it kind of goes back to what I had said earlier. It's trying to thread that needle between the, the community and staff and students who really want more structure and trying to also ha have that flexibility. So it's, it's the idea of how much is asynchronous that, that recorded and, and what it, how much of it is synchronous and having that direct instruction by the teacher and that interaction uh, by the students. And one of the things that we're hopeful, and you've heard from everyone say this, we're all hopeful sooner rather than later, we're moving back to in-person instruction. So for us, one of the guiding principles was Let's try to create an environment that allows us to move back into in-person instruction in a more seamless fashion than a, a school day that is, quite honestly, from eight in the morning till nine at night. The other reality is um, our educators. They too have lives and they, they were feeling like they were trying to teach 
honestly, we heard this on a consistent basis from eight in the morning until 10 o'clock at night because they felt like they had to respond all the time to, to parents and students. And they were too asking for some structure in their lives because many of them have to go home or go into the next room uh, and, and support their families as well and try to have those opportunities. So for us, and I'm sure the other districts too, it, it's trying to, trying to balance all the requests and all the hopes and dreams for online learning to the reality of we're still trying to deliver a high quality instruction for our students on a daily basis. I think I'll jump in here if that's okay. I do think that one of the silver linings on this situation that none of us would have wished for is the ability to innovate. And I think that's what your question goes back to is can we innovate? Can we do things a little bit differently while we're in this environment? And um, I know I wasn't called on for special ed, but one example of innovation is telehealth. We weren't doing any special ed services via telehealth, and now we are, some of them. I mean, it doesn't work for everything, but it does work for some. So I like the concept of taking the silver lining and being able to innovate. And I think what Paul was just talking about, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous, is a piece of that innovation. So synchronous, meaning we're face-to-face -face right now, this is synchronous. But this is also recorded. So later on, somebody's going to look at it at a different time. That's asynchronous. So as we're building our schedules, we're building in synchronous times and asynchronous times. So there's times we need to be face to face working with each other. And there's times that there would be flexibility to, um, to do the work at a time that makes the most sense for the student and the family. So I do feel like that's a piece of what we're considering. And like Paul says, simultaneously, we need to be ready to go back to school because you know what? We're all gonna wear masks. We're gonna drop community transmission of this virus and we're gonna go back to school. So we need to be ready for both. I appreciate that word flexibility. And I think that's what a lot of families are asking for. Um, I also love talking about innovation. Um, is there cross coordination between the districts and, and around the state where we're facing um, we're facing a lot of new right now in all of our worlds. Um, are the superintendents working together to help share best practices and, and ideas and lessons learned? I'll jump in again. Um, in North Central Washington, the superintendents, uh, we work together twice a week. And we've been doing this um, all summer, at, at least twice a week. That's the minimum amount of time that we collaborate with each other. So absolutely, we are collaborating with each other. I would say more than I've ever seen. Would you agree? Um, it's pretty fantastic, and I love it. Um, so yes, we are collaborating with each other all the time. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, we, we're seeing some questions about lunch and meal delivery. How will that continue um, across districts? You know, what I'm hearing is that each district is having to come up with situations that work within their community. Uh, some will be working to try to distribute meals within schools. Some are looking at locations off campus. We're still asking for clarification from the Food and Drug Administration. Excuse me, it's not that, it's the, uh, the, the state. As far as what will be allowed, is there any opportunity to return to the delivery methods that were used in the spring as of today? Uh, we have not been given that allowance, uh, yet we're still hopeful. So there will be meal services. Um, right now, it looks like most of those, at least for Eastmont, will be a parent pickup at the, one of our campuses or each campus. I would add in that there's going to be some flexibility um, where even if it is a pickup model, we're going to have the flexibility to pick up multiple meals so and, and for multiple students. So uh, uh, a parent could conceivably come in and pick up two or three days worth of pre-prepared meals uh, for their family, and that, that'll help with um, not having to run constantly up to the school. So that's, a, that's one thing that we have been assured. I would like to jump in on this because this is a very big problem in remote school districts like Cascade, a very big problem. So Cascade, we have 1,300 students, so we're not considered large as far as student numbers go, but we are huge geographically. 
And this is something where we need community support and advocacy because in the springtime, there was flexibility that was put in place so that we could have our bus drivers transport food to different locations around our district. So we had six different locations and even in some cases we delivered straight to people's homes. And now the information we're being provided is that that will no longer be permitted, which is unacceptable in my mind, unacceptable. Another piece of flexibility we had was providing food to anybody, whether or not they were free and reduced lunch. And that's being limited to, this is also unacceptable. People who ha had a tax situation a year ago, that should not be held against them now. We know what an impact that this virus and the community transmission has had in our region. So we actually need public support on this to advocate for being able to use bus drivers to transport food, one, and number two, providing food for any kid who needs it, no matter the free and reduced lunch status of their parent. Right now, if we have to follow the current rules we're in, we're gonna have to do like what Garn said and provide some food at our schools, but that will not reach all of the children of Cascade School District. I find that completely unconscionable in this environment that we're in. So please reach out to legislators, uh, not just local legislators, but also our state senators, people who can advocate in Washington, D.C., as well as in Olympia, because this is not okay. That was a mic drop, and there is nothing yeah. else to add there. That was like, woo, <laughs> preach, sister, preach. <laughs> it makes me so upset. It hurts my heart so much. We had these six different locations, our district so big, and so that people could have a shorter distance to get there. Sometimes kids would ride their bikes up there. Um, to have rules in place during a pandemic that prevents us from feeding children, I feel like is unacceptable. Agreed, thank you. And thank you for your passion on that subject too. Um, I see that we're rolling around to one o'clock and even though I have pages of questions left that we've received in advance and I know that we haven't answered everything on Zoom and on Facebook, um, I would like to turn it over to um, each, each district and panelists to thank you for your expertise and your work on behalf of our students and to invite you to say any closing words that you haven't had a chance to. I think most has been said, but Kristen, I just again wanna reach out and thank the Wenatchee Valley Museum for these opportunities uh, because this message is spread far and wide. Uh, the distribution of, of this is huge. So thank you for helping amplify all of our voices in our room and, and within our school districts. So this is tremendous. I think Garn really hit it on the head. We're in a partnership. We, we, we've got to lock arms with other school districts, with our community, with our students and, and our parents and our staffs to really make this thing work. Because it, it, it can't be just the school districts th that are, are gonna pull this off. We've got to be there together. We've got to give each other some grace. We want you to keep asking the hard questions as well. Um, we may not always have the answer right then and there, but we'll figure it out because of our partnerships with everybody here and across the, the North Central region. But uh, we're excited to start the school year because our students are coming back. It, we're all educators. We're all teachers at heart. And we cannot wait to get our, our students, our staff return next week and our students uh, the week after. So we're super excited to start the school year. It's not where we wanted to be, but it's where we're at. Um, and I'll also hit the same piece, mask up. Everybody mask up. We need it. We want to lower those rates. We want to see your students. We want to see them in the classroom. We want our teachers in the classroom, but it's not going to, it will not happen if we don't lower those rates. 75 cases per 100,000 just to get us into hybrid. We have to have that for 14 days. 25 cases per 100,000 for full face-to-face, -face, all students coming in. This is not an education piece. This is just how our community comes back together and, and does good work for everybody. Because this is, this is about businesses. This is about education. This is about our life. So mask up. I think 
Paul said it well. I'm eager to get back to uh, having a nice uh, Friday or Saturday evening football game or basketball game or baseball or soccer or bowling match with Wenatchee and see who gets to walk home smiling. Uh, the first day of school is always one of the best days of the school year as well as graduation. Uh, we're missing two of those and I wish that was not part of our career. At the same time, on my reading table at home is the August edition of the National Geographic and they've done a full feature issue on pandemics and you'll see some articles from over 100 years ago of communities completely masked up and Paul's right. Uh, I also like to remind people that we're all on this call today because our ancestors have lived through pandemics. Uh, living has never been safe. There's always been a danger element whether we're driving to work, walking to work, or whatever we're doing but it's people that are on this call that are tasked right now to put these pieces together, to work together, to share the best ideas possible as well as our community and parents to share their input. Give us a little grace. People are working really hard. And every educator that walks into these schools has a lot of the same issues that everyone else does. They have had family members lose income, family members lose jobs, and they're trying to figure out how to work with their children too. So thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I just say thanks to my professional colleagues that are on the call. It's a, an honor to be associated with all of you. Well, thank you so much. I, I know this time you've each spoken to this has been difficult for us as a community, for our teachers and our administrators and our students and their families. And I want to thank everyone for their hard work on behalf of all of our students. I especially want to thank um, you as our panelists for joining us today and for the opportunity as a community to learn directly from our administrators from you about the return to school. To our community attendees, I want to thank you for your thoughtful questions and your participation. And I would love to invite the superintendents back again to talk about as we near that 25 or 75 per 100,000 case, how we can approach that hybrid model or how we can invite our students back into the, the classroom. Um, thank you again for your time today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, wear a mask. <laughs>